State Sports Link's third down chirp is delivered by Papa John's. Better ingredients, better pizza. Visit papajohns.com today for more info. Greetings and welcome to the sixth third down chirp. Thanks for joining us on this homecoming week special. I'm Kyle Binder, joined by Pat Boylan and Chris Rankle. Guys, after this show, the season's halfway over. What happened to the year? Yeah, you and I were talking about this, trying to figure it out as well. You wait so long for football season, for college football season to get here, and then it leaves you in a flash. But if the second half of the season is as exciting as the first half was, we're in for a fun ride, guys. All right, let's take a look back at the Oklahoma game. The Cardinals played on the road in Norman. Undoubtedly the biggest crowd the Cardinals will play in front of all year long, nearly 85,000 Boomer Sooners packed into Memorial Stadium. It was very loud, but the Cardinals quieting them early. They get the opening kickoff, a little trickery. The Cardinals onside kick, and they come up with it underneath the pile. Talk about a gutsy call from Coach Lembo. The Cardinals though, should have taken advantage of this momentum. They were not able to. Yeah, right away, Ball State uh, had that, but Oklahoma came back after the Cardinals couldn't move the ball, and a touchdown right here from Landry Jones to James Hanna for a six-yard pass. And then after that, though, the Cardinals forced a fumble on the punt uh, return. And Steven Schott puts it through the uprights on the field goal. 34 yards out, 10 to 3 after one. But in the second quarter, off the quick snap, Dom Whaley goes off the left side for the Sooners. He goes into the end zone. Two touchdowns for him and 109 yards. Ball State really was not ready on this play. Half the defense falling asleep. The Cardinals knew this quick snap was coming from Oklahoma. They just weren't ready for it. Unfortunately for the Cardinals, the downfall started right here on this play. One of the four turnovers in the game is Keith Winning's pass gets knocked up, and Tony Jefferson comes down with a beautiful interception, giving the Sooners great field position. And he's not done yet. Keith Winning trying to throw this ball away, but Jefferson comes up with a one-handed grab and stays in bounds. Yeah, and as Coach Lembo said, Winning's got to throw this ball so hard his arm falls off, but what a grab by Tony Jefferson, one-handed and to get a foot in bounds. Incredible. And these plays are only going to happen against the number one team in the country. Oklahoma has so many great athletes all over the field. Keith Wenning just got to throw it off. Still in the first half, Landry Jones making it look easy to his top man, Ryan Broyles, one of the best in the country. 27-yard strike as they are too tough for the Cardinals. And Oklahoma wins 62-6. to As they look at the final stat monitor, not a lot of good things for the Cardinals, but uh, Oklahoma is just so impressed in their numbers to back it up. Landry Jones at 425 yards throwing the football in just three quarters. That's about 17 yards a pass. Phenomenal numbers for a guy that's going to be an early first round pick should he choose to forego his senior season. But one positive for Ball State, look, you got Juwan Edwards, 53 yards rushing, even Dwayne Donegan, 41 yards rushing. The Cardinals still able to get it done on the ground. Definitely uh, a night to forget for Keith Winning. Three interceptions and uh, one turnover fumbling and didn't get over the 100-yard mark. Obviously, a couple of those were very unlucky, but a time for him to remember or for, to forget. And uh, let's take a listen to Keith Le or uh, to Coach Pete Lembo rather, after the game. Uh, I think our team is a lot more confident now than it was back in the back in this was a humbling experience tonight, uh, and uh, hopefully we'll have a better week of practice and uh, be ready to go against a very, very good Temple team next week. Obviously, the Oklahoma offense dominated Ball State's defense in many facets, but it's such a good offense that any team in the country is going to have a tough time defensively stopping that high-powered offense. And I don't think you'd find many people disagreeing with you if you said this is the number one quarterback to wide receiver tandem in the nation in Landry Jones to Broyles. And you see here, Jones, what impressed me so much about the Oklahoma quarterback was his pocket presence. Always seemed calm. When you got a guy like Broyles to throw to, why wouldn't you be? Broyles statistically is the number one wide receiver uh, in Big 12 history. And you think about the wide receivers that have come out of the Big 12, you're in some good company there. They're so deep as well. Their third string running back, a guy that only played late in the game, was the number two running back in the nation out of high school just two years ago from top to bottom. This team is absolutely loaded, Chris. But it wasn't all Oklahoma's offense. Ball State really not doing themselves any favors. As you see on this play, we said it before, Ball State's defense just not ready. Travis Freeman didn't even have his helmet snapped up when the ball was snapped. It's here we're going to get a better look at it. 
right about there. Freeman still putting his helmet on. The Oklahoma offense took advantage of that, able to do whatever they wanted with this Ball State defense. But the Cardinals also dealing with a lot of injuries to the secondary throughout the game. So uh, not completely their fault when he got younger freshmen coming in uh, as well. A guy who was a freshman last year threw a lot of interceptions, but hasn't so far this year, but did. Keith winning three of those. Uh, you knew they were going to come at some point. He's human. They're going to happen. How does he move past that? I think it's really important he has a good start to that Temple game, and he can't come out. He throws an interception early on that first drive, something like that. Then maybe you have to worry about his psyche. But here's a stat for you guys. 47 drives in those first four games that Keith Wenning have with the offense. No INTs in those 47 drives. The next three in the second quarter, you see one of them there and more coming. The next three drives all resulted in interceptions. So to go 47 straight without any is impressive, and to go three straight with three uh, is not so impressive. But, uh, you know, really it's just a wait-and-see game. Coach Lembo says he doesn't seem shook in practice, but you really can't tell until you get on the field on Saturday. Well, Keith's the kind of kid that even if he has, he throws out and throws for 500 yards, he's going to think, what could I have done to throw for 1,000? He just always thinks, what should I have done better? He's got to realize that these plays only happen against a team like Oklahoma. Get, put it behind him, short memory, and play well against Temple. Yeah, and a couple of those tip balls as well. There's a very unlucky plays that the ball bounced uh, in Oklahoma's direction. All right, so Oklahoma game's done. That means it's all conference play from here on out. Uh, Three and two, though, as you hit that, you have one game against Buffalo. It's a conference game. But after the first five games, three and two, before you look at the season, before the schedule, three and two, is that surprising? It's, it's a little bit surprising, but it's, it's very good, and it's a very good spot for these Cardinals to be in. Two and two non-conference, including games against South Florida, which you're probably not going to win, and a game against Oklahoma where you're definitely not going to win. That means they beat Army and they beat IU, which Coach Limbo called toss-ups, and that might be even giving uh, Ball State a little bit too much credit. If you look at the odds makers, they say the Cardinals should be one in four. They've been underdogs in four of their first five games this week or this year, and guess what, guys? They're underdogs again versus Toledo Temple. One of the things that I look at is there are no major injuries on this team yet. Now, they have been banged up, but as Coach Lembo said, every team in the country is dealing with an injury of some kind. What I mean by major injuries is no one is out for the season yet. Knock on wood, it could happen any place, so Ball State has to be ready for that. But Keith Wenning is healthy. Jawan Edwards is healthy. Their offensive line, who's been banged up throughout the, year, the past years, they're all healthy. So looking good going forward into MAC play for Ball State. Yeah, just pray for no more injuries in the secondary of all places. All right, let's check out what else happened around the MAC. presented by Fox College Sports. Toledo over Temple at Temple. That is a huge win and kind of a, a scratcher uh, on, on the head there. What happened there? I, I don't know, Kyle. I mean, Temple went out and beat Maryland by 31 points the week before. Then Toledo trounces them in their own backyard. Shocking to me. Don't get me wrong. Toledo, a great team, maybe the MAC's best, but Temple have been running over their opponents so far. Akron and Eastern Michigan kind of bottom tier teams in the past few years, but Eastern gets a slight margin. Yeah, this was a, a matchup of two teams really struggling in the Mid-American Conference this year. Eastern just a little bit better than Akron. And Ohio over Kent State at home, you'd expect a little bit uh, more scoring from Ohio, not just a seven-point win, maybe not as impressive as we thought they were early on in the season. Well, in those first four games, it kind of seemed like Kent State had taken a step back and Ohio has stepped forward. You wouldn't know it by that score. Ohio needed every minute of that one to pull out the victory. Western Michigan continues to impress, beating UConn, a Big East team, 38-31. to Western Michigan looking very, very strong. They continue to impress me from week to week. Western Michigan much improved from last year. Watch out for the Broncos, a dark horse in the conference. Bowling Green had a lead early. Uh, but that's all it was. It was just very early on West, West Virginia with a big win. And the West Virginia offense is good. It's not that good. The defense is going to be the Achilles heel for this uh, Bowling Green team this season, I think. And then you see this score central over Northern Illinois. You throw everything out that you thought you knew about the MAC when you see that score central Michigan winning and also scoring 48 points. This continues to baffle me. It's been a week, and I still can't believe Central beat Northern Illinois and scored 48 points. Toss everything you knew about the MAC out the window because anything can happen. Well, let's take a look at the MAC standings now. Not a ton of games played in the MAC uh, as of yet, obviously, but uh, four teams on the west side all tied at 1 0. Those uh, look for, like pretty quality teams. Eastern will probably uh, drop out of there, but any surprises there? I think Central Michigan, just because you don't know where they're going to end up. Some people had them third or fourth. Some people had them finishing behind Eastern. 
for last, and they looked more to be towards the last of the division in their first four games, but then come up with the shocker. The big shocker, though, is NIU sitting there at the bottom. Yeah, but you look at Toledo and NIU, 2-3 and three overall. Um, of course, NIU 0-1, Toledo 1-0. Don't let that fool you. Those two teams will be competing for the MAC West title. And how about Miami of Ohio, 0-4 to start the season? Well, the football team flew to Oklahoma this past weekend, but Pat, Chris, Ben, our producer, and I decided to take the uh, take the road instead of the airplane that's just too easy of a way to go so check out our 1600 mile expedition to oklahoma on the flip cam all right well uh, we're about ready to leave gloomy muncie and head for 80 degree and sunny weather in oklahoma get ready guys ready, Let's go. ready? Yeah. <laughs> Oklahoma, about to check in the Super 8 Motel, and we're heading out to the game. in Norman, Oklahoma. It was a fun time. Pat's back in the driver's seat after Chris last night. Had it for about five minutes. Ran over a parking curb, ran a red light, and left the lights on twice in the minivan. So Pat's back in the driver's seat. We're ready to go on a nice long 11-hour trip. about midnight we made it back to Carmel we're switching out from the silver bullet back to Pat's car uh, we, we would be remiss though if we didn't honor the leaf this leaf stuck onto the antenna in Effingham Illinois on the way to Oklahoma and it's still on there it somehow managed to finagle its way around the antenna and stayed going 70 miles an hour for countless hours and so we're gonna take it as a little memento Oh. <laughs> yes. Well, the injuries uh, piled up continue to uh, this game against Oklahoma. You go into that type of game, you're like, oh, I don't want any more injuries. That's a win. But more injuries in the secondary, you just when it rains, it pours once again. And you, when you, you knew when you saw Armand Dehaney go out on that first punt for Ball State that it was just going to be a bad day, and it's unbelievable how the injuries have targeted the defensive backs. You look at the rest of the team, they've stayed pretty healthy, and the defensive backs just decimated. At one point, Kyle, you and I counted, we had up to seven injuries in the defensive backfield, which included every starter and every backup. Now, the good thing is they're starting to get a little bit healthier. Jason Pinkson, he's probable this week, but Sean Baker and Howard, they're doubtful, and Chris, bring in, sec bring in safety three and four to fill in for those guys most likely against Temple. But one positive of having all these injuries, of course, you'd love to have Baker and Howard out there, but we're seeing what kind of young talent we have coming up through the ranks. There's guys like Eric Patterson, Andre Dawson, Chris Callaway all played very well. Coach Lumbo very impressed how they've been able to step in on short notice and play very well. So good down the road, but you'd like to have those guys back. Well, we mic'd up almost all the coaches on the team so far, but this week, wide receiver coach Keith Gaither makes his first appearance. Great job at the LOS. Mirror the guy. Pick your feet up, and then at the point of no return, then you offhand jam, okay? My coaching philosophy when I coach my kids, I talk to them about three things. Number one, I want them to compete every rep. Eyes. Good. Go drive back to the ball. Good. Number two, I want them to have fun. Boom. On this last one, boom, I'm going to shock you with a ball. And number three, I want them to get better every, every day. Ah, uh, too much at the line. Come on. Good release. Don't chase another color, Cruz. Don't chase the color. On the field, I try to be positive. I think when you give positive feedback, the kids respond better. G cross his face. Good. Great catch. All day. Go get it. Go get it. 
Good, good, get them all. Pound the pavement right there. Great job right there, T. Okay, inside foot back, let's go. Turn in, let the ball talk to you, good job. Come on, B. Hey, keep your shoulders up. Well, a positive that came out of the Oklahoma game with the two field goals from Steven Schott. The Cardinals stay perfect in red zone opportunities. Uh, still time for top in the nation. That's definitely a good sign and a positive uh, coming out of a loss. 19 for 19 and scoring in the red zone. That's a real good number uh, if you're Ball State. And obviously that's tied for the nation lead. It's impossible to get, to get, to get better than 100%. But a lot of that credit goes obviously to Keith Wanning for finding the guys open in the end zone. A guy that maybe many people aren't thinking of those. Jawan Edwards, you think about how many clutch runs he's had near the five-yard line to really plow his way into the end zone. And then, of course, Steven Schott. If he misses a field goal in the red zone, uh, that number doesn't count. Now, Schott's missed a couple, but neither of those were in the red zone. So it's really a group effort. And for a young team like this, Chris, something pretty uncharacteristic. You're telling me that every time this team gets inside the 20-yard line, they come away with points, whether that be three, six, seven, maybe even eight. That is a very good thing heading into MAC play. you got to get the points wherever you can get them. Yeah, and the turnovers uh, where you don't turn the ball over in the red zone is huge. Because uh, you get do all that work to get down there, and as long as you score and don't turn it over, that's definitely positive in the long run of the game. All right, time for the What's Chirpin' segment of the show. Remember, follow us on Twitter, at Third Down Chirp, and tweet us a question each week for a chance to win a free Papa John's pizza. This week, we're mixing it up a little bit. We tweeted earlier in the week to tweet us your favorite homecoming event of the week. And this week, we picked Steph Bristow from right here at Ball State University. She said, my favorite homecoming event would have to be the football game. The momentum from the week shows on the field. Chirp, chirp, hashtag. That's a big one. You guys, you guys like the football game the most? I'm going to agree with her. I'm going to pick the football game. It's an easy choice. <laughs> it's easy to pick that one. But what I think is so fun about the football game is you have, you know, your events, your air jam, your bed races. Everything kind of leads up, builds the momentum, and then you have the football game. And hopefully they can uh, win this one. They're, they haven't won since 2008, but, you know, I, I just like how everything leads up to that game. I'm going to go off the path a little bit and not choose the football game. I'm going to go with Air Jam. It's a lot of fun. You know, it kicks off the homecoming weekend the right way on Thursday. You just all the dancing and singing and everything. It's, it's a great way. Yeah, you don't have the nickname Hips for nothing. I mean, we, we know you love the dance, and I can see how you get into that, Chris. Uh, my, my personal favorite, I would have to say, uh, would definitely be the bed races. Gotta love the costumes. You never know where those beds are going to go uh, either. Saw some blood last year, so that's uh, a lot of fun. Well, after a tough loss on the road, it's a perfect time to have a game in Muncie for homecoming. The Cardinals will be hosting the Temple Owls for the very first time here in Muncie. Always an extra buzz in the air on campus for the team to feed off of with the homecoming week. But the defensive side of the ball took more bruises like we have mentioned in Oklahoma. Armand Dehaney, Sean Baker, and Josh Howard all were knocked out of the game. So prepare, preparing for another shorthanded week defensively, here's defensive coordinator Jade Bateman and linebacker Travis Freeman. They want to run a power play where they want to get those linemen wrapped around and get them to the next level and things like that, which Buffalo did the same thing. So, um, so uh, we've, seen, we've, seen the, uh, we've seen the scheme before. Now we have to execute it. Yeah, I would say they're more like Buffalo, and I, and I thought we did a really good job against Buffalo early in the, in the first half, especially against their, their, pri their primary run game, you know, the two-back run game. And they're going to run something. You know, they're going to run power and try and come right at you. And I think our D-line and our linebackers are pretty good at that. It's always a challenge to have a, a running quarterback. You know, that's, that's, that's why guys like Michael Vick and Vince Young are so good in the NFL because it brings, another, it brings another element to offense. When you're dropped back into coverage and you think you got everything covered, here you go, you got the quarterback spreading out the backfield. So it's always a challenge, but you have to embrace the challenge and things like that. Uh, the key for us is going to be, you know, guys like Kyle Hoke and guys like Andy Putoff and guys like Travis Freeman that have played a ton of football that are out there helping those young guys make checks and make calls. And, and uh, they're talented kids. They just haven't played a whole lot. So if they weren't talented, we'd be, you know, we'd be feeling worse about things. But they've got ability. They just got to go out and play now. Well, those guys on the defensive side of the ball have a big task in stopping Bernard Pierce from Temple. Uh, he's an experienced back as well. He really is. Ever since his freshman year, he caught the Mid-American Conference by storm, and he's really not let up since. He's an interesting combination of a running back. He has a lot of speed, but he's not considered a quick back. He has a lot of power, but he's not considered a power back. Really where he gets you is his vision. He's got great field vision. He can turn a two or three yard carry into more. His legs never stop going. And Coach Lembo talked about him. He said, you would see Bernard Pierce in a BCS conference uniform and not think 
a thing about it. And he's definitely going to be the big piece that Ball State's going to need to stop if they want to win on Saturday. And stopping an all-purpose back like that who has the size, the speed, the vision, it's going to take a lot out of this Ball State defense. What they're going to have to do is hit him at the line. Pierce likes to get north and south, but he's not afraid to kind of run east and west. But even when he goes east and west, he's still going north and south, getting those hard yards. So hit him at the line. you got to gang tackle because he's got that power, and he could break away. And if you're not going to do that, and if he's going to try to sweep it out, make him run east and west. Make him tired. Don't let him get the tough yards, but it's going to be very tough for Ball State to stop this guy. Continuing with the offensive side of the ball, kind of a new system that the Cardinals haven't seen all year, and a unique one. Uh, they have two quarterbacks that do play. One throws, one can run, uh, but does throw as well, but he definitely rushes more. Kind of a, a tandem that's unique. The Cardinals are going to have to step up and stop here with a, with a bruised up team. Yeah, the runner Stewart and the thrower more is Girardi. But, you know, I wouldn't really say that either of them have a good throwing arm and are, you know, a good quarterback in terms of throwing the football. Stewart's very elusive. He can get away from you. But he almost reminds me of Army's quarterback a little bit in the fact that he's going to look at one read, maybe a second, but might not even get there, and he's going to take off. Girardi will step back and throw the football a little bit more, and he's had some more success throwing it. But, uh, you know, really, Really, that's not the strong point of their offense, and that's where Toledo really got them. They got up big, and uh, Temple had to go away from their bread and butter, which is running it. Reminds me a lot of Army, which the Cardinals got out to a big league, and I think that'll be the key this week. Ball State can get out to a lead and force Temple to throw the football. Temple ranks 109th out of 120 FBS teams. Ball State's definitely going to have to get out to a big lead against them. But with this two-quarterback rotation, it makes it very hard to prepare for as a defense. But as an offense, it gets very hard to get any kind of rhythm or momentum. What Ball State's going to have to do is really disrupt this Temple offense early on, no matter who's in at quarterback. Make them make the change often in the game and that won't work for Temple because they, they like to have the same guy in there. They like to get a rhythm, get some momentum going. Ball State can keep them from doing that. They're going to be able to shut down this Temple offense. Minus the last game against Toledo, this Temple team is, has come out very strong under a new coach. Al Golden uh, went to Miami and Florida, and really it's been a seamless transition. Uh, the Toledo team, very good team, but still not a, not a good loss. Uh, but... Three and two, as are the Cardinals, both new coaches. Pretty good start here for Temple. There's a couple different thought processes that go into hiring a head coach. The first one is to get a guy like Pete Lembo, a guy who's been a head coach all his life. He's working on uh, 10 years of being a head coach in collegiate football. He's turned around Lehigh, he's turned around Elon, and so far it looks like he's turning around Ball State. The other uh, option to go with that is a guy like Coach Adazio, which Temple now has, and he comes from Florida, the offensive coordinator, at maybe the most prestigious team over the past five or ten years. He's coached with the best, he's coached the best, and he's doing a good job uh, at Temple as well. So I think both philosophies really working out for these two teams. Well, when you hire a head coach, as you said, uh, there's just this little tangible that head coaches have. It's the ability to coach a team to be that guy. Not all coordinators have it, as we saw with Charlie Weiss trying to become a head coach at Notre Dame. He failed. Um, Kevin Wilson seems to be very, really struggling at Indiana. Steve Adazio seems to be adjusting relatively well. However, Pete Lembo, we know he has that intangible. He's led teams and turned them around and won big games. Steve Adazio, on the other hand, he has the big game experience. Two national championships. He coached Tim Tebow, Chris Leak, uh, Chris Rainey, all the, Percy Harvin, all these big time names. So you kind of got the best of both worlds, but both of them seem to be doing very well. But give a little bit of an edge to Pete Lembo for having that head coaching experience. Yeah, and he's already won a new head coaching uh, matchup against Wilson, like you said, from Oklahoma, a very prestigious program as well. So we'll wait to see on Saturday uh, if Coach Lembo can win that one again. Time for the players to watch for you guys this week. Who's it going to be? I'm assuming the defensive side of the ball. Yeah, middle linebacker, Travis Freeman for me. Uh, he's the guy in the middle. He's involved in the pass. He's involved in the run. And he had one of his worst weeks as a Cardinal last week. And part of that was due to the fact that he didn't practice all week and he was just kind of thrown into the mix and he looked about a step or two behind. Now, Travis Freeman, his off game is a good game for a lot of players. So that's not too much of a diss his direction, but you know Temple's going to run the football and the ball's going to come his way a whole lot. And if Travis Freeman's not on his game, the Cardinals could struggle in this one. For me, it's got to be Kyle Hoke. It looks like Sean Baker will not be able to play in this game. Kyle Hoke's going to step in and start for him. Hoke's got to be able to play really well against the run. 
Matt Brown and Bernard Pierce are going to get into the second and third level of the defense. Coach Lembo said, you don't stop these guys, you just try to contain them. Kyle Hoke's got to be able to come up, support the run, but also be prepared for when Temple pulls out that elusive pass. So Hoke's going to have to have a big game. He's going to have to be a leader and show these young guys, I'm going to step up, I'm going to play well, and I'm going to fill this hole left by Sean Baker. I'm going to go to the offensive side of the ball, and Jawan Edwards obviously had a slow game against Oklahoma, just like everyone else. But against this Temple defense that allows less than 100 yards on the ground, I think Jawan is going to have to be a huge factor for the Cardinals to be able to get a balanced attack going because that's when they've been most successful when they have a balanced attack. Uh, that's all we have, though, for this show this week on Homecoming. But don't forget, Thursday at 3 online. Also, WIPB, Comcast, and Fox College Sports is where you can see Third Down Chirp. Also, follow us on Twitter at Third Down Chirp and at BSU Sports Link. But remember, if you can't make it out to the game, don't worry. Listen live to SportsLink Radio on 91.3 WCRD and WCRD.net. Mark Champion will be our special guest this week on the broadcast as well. For Chris Rankle, Pat Boylan, I'm Kyle Biner. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you next week.